Uh, well, we've got uh, a, a multitude of people in the audience today, a lot of college students from varying locations in our audience. And there are many that would like to know uh, a, a, quite a bit. They would like to be where you are. So let's start with the job itself. What is a day in the life of Matthew Berry? Depends on the day, to be candid. Um, you know, in season... In season, it also depends on the day. So let's uh, let's assume it's in season. And, you know, it's interesting because my life is sort of divided into three sections, right? There's off season, which is where we are now. And you're still tracking news, the Carson Wentz trade, the, you know, the, you know, is Deshaun Watson going to go anywhere? All those, all those nuggets and all of them, Matthew Stafford to the Rams, they all have fantasy impacts. So you're always tracking that. And when, when news happens, you produce content and uh, we do an off-season podcast that I do once a week, but it's a fairly light lift, as it were, until we get into the heart of free agency, until we get to the NFL Combine, until we get to the, the NFL draft. Uh, in, then there's August, in essence, which is the preseason for fantasy football, and then there's the actual NFL season, you know, September, first week of September until uh, the new year. So I guess my question to you back would be, and I'll answer anything you want, but hmm. pick a time frame for me. Uh, pick a time frame for me, and I can tell you what my day is like there. Hmm. All right. So let's say leading up to the the two months leading up to football season. The two months leading up to football season. I mean, it are, is July and August, and so July is when I take vacation, and my kids are out of school, and so that's fairly relaxed. I'll do some off season columns. I'll do my, you know, I usually do like my draft day manifesto. I do a column called "100 Facts You Need to Know." So I'll do some sort of research intensive articles, but, you know, and podcasts here and there, but July is a fairly light month for me, but then August, every single day, I'm doing a podcast. I'm usually on TV. Uh, there's a couple of days there in the middle of August where we do our fantasy football marathon, where I stay up for 28 straight hours uh, doing live TV and try not to get fired. Um, <laughs> and so somehow, you know, I'm, and I'm chugging Red Bulls and I'm like, you know, and you're getting pretty loopy and, uh, but it's been a lot of fun and uh, we've done it for a number of years now. I think this upcoming one will be our sixth and uh, it's always very successful and well-received by fans. But, and then in August, you're also doing, so, I mean, like I'm working every single day in August. So like a typical day, wake up, uh, wake up early, go to the studio, do makeup, have a, have a pre-production meeting for the podcast, do the podcast and, um, Usually on the drive into on the drive into the studio, I'm having a conference call with my producers of the fantasy show. You see the logo behind me here. I'm I'm green screening it here for you guys. I'm not actually on the set. Um, and uh, I have a call with my producers as we go through what we want to do on the show that day. And you know, how do I feel about this? How do I feel about that? What story do we want to lead with? That kind of thing. And um, and get more into that later. Uh, and then. Uh, and then I get out of the podcast, try to grab a little uh, bite to eat, because if I don't eat, uh, I never will. So I force myself to eat. <laughs> and, then, and then we do the show. And then invariably, because it's the preseason, there's a lot of content demands and needs. There are, you know, from the set of the fantasy show, we'll shoot a segment for NFL Live or for Sports Center or something like that. Or we'll get a call. You know, we're reacting to news, obviously, as, as it happens throughout the, uh, throughout the preseason do a bunch of live events as well. And not obviously this past year with the pandemic, but in previous seasons, you know, we're going to do our podcast. We do our, our podcast live in Philadelphia, in New York. We've gone to LA, Detroit, Baltimore, like all over the country, Houston, we've done it. We, you know, and so, um, uh, you know, there's always like events that you go and you do and, and make appearances as well. And so it's a, uh, you know, pretty and you're constantly updating your rankings and you know you're watching the preseason games although so not a lot season. not a lot going on is what you're saying you don't do this it's pretty relaxed august is, august first is when my wife kisses me goodbye and says i'll see you in the, you know, <laughs> see you in the well you touched on a couple of things there you mentioned your podcast you mentioned the tv shows and the articles that you write in the preseason what's your favorite medium personally speaking what's your favorite medium to participate in uh that's a great question. Only great questions coming out of here today, Matthew. My favorite medium to participate in. 
my the best my, the favorite part of my job is this is the fantasy show that I do for ESPN Plus, which is our streaming service. And for people in the audience that have seen it or maybe they've seen the clips, that's the show with the puppets. That's the show with Daniel Dopp, who's my podcast producer. He's my co-host on the show. He has a big bushy beard and full sleeve tattoos and a nose ring and um, looks like no one else on ESPN and is hilarious and great person and a great talent. And uh, we've got the puppets and we get weird and we just have fun. <laughs> and, and I love the I love the process of putting that show together. The show makes me laugh. The show is the one thing. Everything else that I do, and it's not to say that I don't have supervision on the fantasy show, because obviously I do. But, you know, when I write my column, it, uh, when I write my column, it goes through two levels of editors, sometimes three. Uh, you know, and I know like one and a half to two million people are going to read that. And so ESPN, you know, obviously we're owned by the Walt Disney Company and we, we take our brand very seriously. And so, you know, there's parameters you know, there's journalistic guidelines and there's also uh, ESPN internal guidelines. So literally it goes through usually three set, two sets of editors and sometimes three, depending on the topic, uh, before it gets from me to, to uh, the front page of ESPN.com. And then my podcast, I do, we do it live. We do it live for an hour. So I'm in front of a live microphone and I'm on an ESPN platform and you're always scared of, scared is not the right word, but you always want to be mindful of the same thing that again, you know, we, we try to be family friendly. We want to have fun and, you know, be interesting, but you know, I'm not going to curse. I'm not going to say anything up, off color. I don't, it's also my own personality, right. Is, is, um, uh, you know, not to be, not to be insulting, to be inclusive of everyone, you know, not trying to be, um, uh, antagonistic to any one particular group. And so, um, being on a live microphone, you don't have, you don't have a safety net, right? I mean, how many times have we seen somebody get in trouble, get fired, get fined, get whatever, because of something they said on a live microphone or something they tweeted or posted on Instagram or what have you, right? And so um, I always have to be careful there. Same with the fantasy football, fantasy football now, which is a three hour live show. But on the fantasy show, um, that was one where I developed enough of an audience uh, where, uh, you know, I, enough of a track record and enough of an audience where ESPN came to me and said, do what you want. We have, we have an idea for a show that's going to be like Jim Cramer's Mad Money. And by that, all we mean is you standing up, talking directly to a camera about fantasy football with, you know, with high energy. Do whatever else you want from that point forward. Our only request is that it doesn't look like anything else on ESPN. We want you to really be different. And I'm like, all right, well, puppets are funny. And, you know, again, I think you can get away more with puppets than you can with human beings in terms of what they say and what they do. And so that show just, that show makes me laugh. And I was just like, they'll probably cancel us in five weeks if we even get that long. <laughs> but this one, I'm just doing this for myself. This is one, everything else I do, you know, I'm within the corporate structure, but this, I just, this is, this is going to be pure what I find funny, what I find interesting, what I find entertaining. I just don't want to do a typical fantasy show where it's me and another and an ex-NFL player and a host, you know, at a desk and we're all in ties and we're all in jackets. And, you know, it's just like, and, you know, who do we like at the flex position and, you know, and whatever. And those shows work. And that's the bread and butter of ESPN and fantasy football now, which is super successful, is fairly similar to that. But I just I didn't want to do that. I wanted it to be a different experience uh, than any of the, of the other content I put out. Yeah. Like if you like if, if somebody was a fan of my column and a fan of the podcast and they tuned in the show, I didn't them be like, oh, well, you're just regurgitating the stuff I heard in the podcast this morning or that I read about in the column. So I wanted it to be a very different experience. Um, and I had this mandate from ESPN to make it different. And so um, I, well, that, the, you know, the producers on the show, uh, you know, the producers on the show, the process of putting that show together. That's just that's my favorite thing to do is that well, show because that's entirely for me. And we are very lucky in that it's one of the most watched studio shows on ESPN Plus. It's it's been a it's a much been a much bigger hit than I thought it would be, and we've already been renewed for our fifth season. And you know, it's that's it, amazing. Okay. That is amazing. Well, it's interesting. I have a question that came in while you were telling that story, and the irony of this is it came in from someone named Michael Fox, 
which ties into yeah. our conversations yesterday. Uh, yeah. But uh, when working with a large company like ESPN, and I believe you sort of touched on this, Matthew, when you were telling your story there, but when working for a company like ESPN, how much free range do they give you? It sounds like they gave you more than they might give others. Yeah, some. I mean, listen, it, I think it depends on who you are and it depends on what you're doing, right? Or, you know, or, you know um, somebody like Stephen A. Smith who is an opinionist, right? Stephen A is hired by ESPN to give his opinion on sports. Uh, Stephen A has a much broader range than somebody like Adam Schefter or Adrian Wojnarowski because those two guys are journalists and they need to stick to, here are the facts. I am reporting this story. ESPN is reporting Matthew Stafford has been traded to the Los Angeles Rams for these picks and this compensation. Like, so you know, somebody like Schefter or Mort or Woj or Jeff Darlington or, you know, Kimberly Martin or any one of our reporters, right? They have to be, they have to be super accurate. Um, so they don't have a lot of leeway at all. But somebody like Stephen A, you know, uh, you know, or listen, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of Skip Bayless's content. Uh, but if, but if Skip Bayless wants to say that LeBron is overrated on our air, which he used to do all the time before he left us to go to Fox, <laughs> Okay, that's his opinion. I think yeah. it's an insane opinion, and I think it's, I think there's, you know, I don't know that it's a genuine one, but whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, whatever. Skip had a role to play, and he played the role, but um, you, you know what I mean? So it's like- I do, so absolutely. And uh, in the case of me, I'm not a journalist. Uh, obviously, there are journalistic standards at ESPN. I can't, I can't slander someone. I can't make something up. I can't, um, you know, uh, I certainly- we have rules internally at ESPN in terms of what we can share on social, in terms of what we can do. They don't want me cursing. They don't want me, you know, like, um, what's a good example? Like, it, you know, on the fantasy show, like they give me free reign, but they also know I'm an adult, right? And that I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do a sketch with like five, you know, scantily clad women. You know what right. I mean? Like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do it. Uh, I'm not gonna do, a sketch where there's, you know, a, a a joke that could be perceived as racist or homophobic or in some way, you know, not inclusionary, right? Would it you be know, safe to say? Would it be safe to say that they've given you guardrails, but they, until you break that trust, you have the ability to build what you build? Correct. Yeah, again, and like I said, there's different shows are built differently and personalities sure. are built differently. But you are correct in the sense that I have over a long career, both at ESPN and just in general. I, I have built up enough of a trust with both my bosses and the management at ESPN and my audience that they, that I think number one is they know what they're getting from me. When they tune into me, uh, they know what they're getting from me. And that's something that I think is important for the students uh, that you guys are like, one thing I always talk about is there's two, two keys to being successful. I think one is brand aware. We can talk about that in a minute, but brand trust. Right. And so uh, brand trust. And when you're an on-air talent, brand trust is like, you expect, you know, when you think about Stephen A. Smith, you expect something, right? When you think about Charles Barkley, you think about something, you, you expect a certain thing. Adam Schefter, when you see Adam Schefter on air, you expect, you know, what he's going to do, right? Even if it's somebody who's unexpected, Howard Stern, you ex that's sort of what you expect out of him is kind of, you know, uh, crazy and all over the place. So, um, so there's that. But I also think it's important, Michael, to talk about that people have brand trust. Sure. Right. I, the example I always give is like, OK, Michael, I've just uh, uh, I've just gotten in, you've, you've just been arrested. You're in jail. Great. And you get one you get one call and it, pretend you're not married. Pretend you know, you're you know, say you're a kid in college. So you're not calling your parents and you're not calling your wife or husband or partner or whatever. You get one call which friend are you calling, right? And immediately I bet everyone in the audience is like, I know which friend I would call. Okay, now Michael, I've just come to you and I said, hey, all expense paid, two tickets to Vegas, huge suite, uh, you know, at, uh, at a five-star hotel, uh, table service at the hottest nightclub and the private jet leaves in two hours. Which friend are you bringing? And I bet again, immediately a friend uh, you know, pops into your head, probably not the same friend right. who needs to bail you out of jail. You know what I mean? Like, and so it's like, we all have, 
brand trust. We all, how people perceive us. And um, when it comes to making it in the sports media world, and honestly, in any profession, but specifically this one, you want to be the person that gets the call when your friend is in jail. You yeah. don't want to be, the, you don't want to be the person that gets the call when your buddy's going to Vegas, even though, you know, that would be a lot of fun. But, you know, I think that makes sense. And just tying it back to this question, ESPN trusts me to, to, you know, and trust my producers to know where the line is. And sure. I'm, a different, I'm a different personality on the TV show where there's a safety net, right? We, we can try wacky things that we're like, ah, that went too far. Ah, let's cut that back. You know, that kind of thing. Ah, right. that didn't really work. Let's tighten that up. Let's redo that. Let's retape that versus the podcast or the, um, uh, the, the Sunday show. Cause those are live. Right. And you, you, know, you go too far. So yeah, well, I mean, I have, would I have more freedom if I worked at some place like Barstool Sports? Of course, right? I mean, but there's, right. you know, there's, uh, there are, um, you know, uh, checks and balances to every place where you might work. And so, yeah, I've been very lucky in that ESPN allows me, um, they certainly allow me more freedom now than when I first started there. Yeah, I think well, if I, I think if I, I'll, I'll just finish one thought, Michael. If I started there now, I don't know that they would let me write, you know, like, I write these 2000 word intros to my column and so many people are like, Hey, people have short attention spans on the internet and everything's started video and don't, why are you writing that? And you know, it's 2000 words before you get to a single football player and they're tuning to you for advice and who to start and said, what are you doing here? And I'm like, yeah, but that's love. hate. love. hates all about me. And that's, you know, that's, that's the column. That's the gig. And, you know, I've been lucky in that my audience has come along for me with that ride and they, you know, so the column is not only the most read, but it's also the most time spent you know, yeah. which is an important metric for ESPN as well, well because I, they, they get invested in that story. I think I hear in there too, a couple of things. One is be true to yourself. When they ask you about those 2000 words, you got to know who you are and you got to be true to yourself. And two, Skip Bayless and Stephen A. Smith are not journalists. We've, we've covered those. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think anyone, uh, I mean, listen, although Stephen A. Smith, I think, what, uh, well, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, but Stephen, <laughs> Smith, no, Stephen A. Smith was a reporter from Philadelphia Inquirer. Like he has, journalistic integrity he had he he can play that role if he needs to be but that's not what he has been pays him to do at the absolutely moment. So I don't absolutely wanna, i don't want to sit here and say you know i'm not saying anything bad about either no either. no more no more high grounds here none at all at all uh one fun question then i'm going to ask you about some history stuff uh, a question that came in said are you still nervous do you still get nervous when you get on camera ever i don't i don't i you know there are moments Listen, I was, you mentioned Avengers. Like I was crazy nervous the first time I stepped on that set. I was nervous the first time I appeared on ESPN. There are times when I get nervous occasionally when, it, when it's something that I. Did we freeze or is it just on my end? Oh, now you're back. Now you're back. Now you're back. Um, no, I don't get nervous. Um, do you get nervous uh, when you freeze on camera? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, look, I, this is, I think that for anyone that wants to be on camera or in front of a microphone in any way, I, I think this is something that I, when I was first, uh, when I first graduated college, I moved out to LA and I thought I wanted to be a sitcom and, and screenwriter. And so I, I kind of this weird career path and I was for a while, I was a TV and movie writer in Hollywood for a long time, but I was nervous. Like, pitching because a lot of when you write you have to pitch right and you know hey this happens and this happens and, and you know and, and so you have to go into rooms with executives and producers and movie stars and pitch them your ideas and so in order to get confidence for that I took some classes at the Groundlings the world famous Groundlings sure. improv group Will Ferrell uh you know uh John Lovitz, like the, you know, um, I think Kristen Wig, like there's a, a zillion people that have come out of the Groundlings. Um, uh very famous. Uh I think I think Mike Myers, the other Mike Myers. Yes. Uh, the lesser and, famous Mike Myers, right? Right, exactly. I think he um uh the Austin Powers Mike Myers, I believe he's he's a groundling. Mm -hmm. At any rate, but it's what I took, and not because I thought I was gonna be an actor, although you know, I am now an actor in the highest person movie of all time, NBD. But um <laughs> <laughs> you know, just throwing that in there. Uh, but, but I took it because I wanted to be comfortable in any situation. What a, what an improv class does, and I took it for a couple of years. I took like three years of improv, and and I would highly encourage it to anyone watching. Forget whether you actually want to be a comedic actor. 
What improv teaches you is to be comfortable in a situation where weird things happen, where the unexpected happens and how to react. And so um, I am now comfortable enough on camera or comfortable enough in front of a microphone and comfortable enough in my own skin, candidly, that no matter what happens, I can, you know, uh, I can go with the flow. And I'm certainly, look, I'm not, I'm not a perfect broadcaster by any stretch. You know, I, I mean, I, I think I'm an adequate broadcaster, if I'm being honest, but I'm very much myself. And I think my audience appreciates that. And I'm, fir- I'm the first one to make a, you know, um, uh, you know, self, uh, what, what, what's what I'm looking for, Michael? Uh, you know, like a- Self-efficating, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, a depreciating joke about- There you go, stuff. self-depreciating, that's the word. Yeah, deprecating, and, and right, yeah. So I'm, I'm the first to make fun of myself, and if you watch the fantasy show uh, on ESPN+, Plus, literally the entire premise of the show is that all the puppets hate me. I mean, you know, like, <laughs> they all, like we have one positive puppet, but every other puppet, like, hates me, makes fun of me, Daniel makes fun of me, like, the premise of the show is really is that um, is that they all just insult me and make fun of me. And, and the, the show is just one big joke about me. And so uh, anyway, so. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Way saying, no, I don't get nervous. I certainly did when I started at ESPN, but yeah. it is like anything. It's reps, man. It's just reps. Yeah. Well, and then that's a great piece of advice. Uh, I know. Unfortunately, we have about ten minutes left. I mean, no, we don't we ever have enough time. Right? I, Michael, I, I sent you an email. We can we can go to our original time. Okay, you know, so we still have fifteen minutes. minutes. Perfect. Would, yeah, perfect, I've perfect. addressed I've addressed my. Uh, That's you know I, the, I think that we're good. The audience will be very happy to hear that. Thank you, thank you. Um, so. Um, let's take a step back. I know we're talking about the positions and the jobs and the things like now, but you mentioned briefly that you are an actor in the highest grossing movie of all time. Uh, that started somewhere, uh, and your career started somewhere long before this. So take us back. I, we, I've gotten a lot of questions about the explosion of fantasy football, about your time in Hollywood and all that stuff sort of happening, not at the same time, but some of it is. So give us a little bit about how you ended up here. Sure. So, and I think it's an, and I would recommend, uh, I wrote a book in 2013 called Fantasy Life, and and I'm not trying to hawk the book, literally. A best-selling, best-selling New York Times, number five, long time. Yeah, that's right. New York Times best-selling book, they get it number five, spent many months on the list. Uh, Not important, but, um, you know, took me two and a half years to write. So, you know, like to mention that. But in all seriousness, um, no, you can buy a used copy of the book for a dollar on Amazon. So, you know, like. But the reason I bring it up is just because the through line of that book is, the, uh, you know, a much more full and rich version of the story I'm about to tell you in terms of how I, how I started as a, uh, a nerdy 14-year-old kid playing fantasy sports to where I am now and that journey and the ups and downs. And I think there's a lot of lessons there in that book for anyone that's interested in uh, my career path and some of the lessons that I learned along the way. But very shortly, uh, 14 years old, uh, 1984, when I was 14 years old, pre-internet, pre-personal computers, uh, you had to keep stats by hand, but uh, there was a book called Rich History League Baseball, which described the greatest game for baseball fans since baseball, which was fantasy baseball, and um, I, uh, there was a league that was forming, and so I, I joined that league, played in that league, I later found out it was one of the first 50 leagues in America ever. Uh, one of the great joys of my life is I once got to do a fantasy baseball auction with uh, Daniel Okrent, who's the, the you know, founding father of rich history baseball. Fan- you guys know his fantasy baseball now. And at um, any rate, so I did that, went to college, graduated, wanted to be a sitcom and movie writer, moved out to Hollywood. I was a, I was a production assistant, a grunt, a gopher, if you will, for a couple of years on sitcoms, getting people lunch and Xerox and copies. Um, Eventually got a job as a writer on sitcoms, did that for a while. Finally, in 1999, uh, so I think I got my first writing job in 94, uh, 1999, people, the internet sort of started around 95. Uh, in 1999, there's a website called Roto World, which uh, they changed the name of it. It was bought by NBC Sports, and they've now changed the name of it. But uh, any fantasy players are aware of Roto World. And this is the days of, you know, CompuServe and AOL when you had to dial up on the internet, <laughs> you know? And so, and like, you've got mail. Like that was actually a novel thing. Like, oh, I've got an email. This is so exciting. Like I'm sure all the college kids are like, can't imagine that time. But uh, if there's anyone older in the audience listening to it, but anyway, it was very early in the days of the internet. 
And this website was advertising for writers. And I think here's a, here's a good lesson. I don't normally tell this part of the story, but I'll tell it because I think it's important for, for our audience here. They had a, they had a they, advertising for writers and it said like jobs at rotoworld.com emailed saying, hey, man, I'm a professional writer living out here in Hollywood. Uh, think of, but, but fantasy sports is my passion. I think it'd be so much fun to write a column on the side. To, you know, could I write a sample? Could I try out? Could I send you something? Do it for free? Could I, you know, no response. Sent one a week later, no response. Sent a third email like, guys, can you just turn me down just so I know somebody's read this? Can I get any kind of response? No response. Like three weeks in a row, no response. So I'm going through the email. And again, this is just sort of a, I think an important lesson, some persis persistence and trying to find creative ways, right? It's, you know, don't always take the first no. You know, you don't want to be uh, belligerent, but you also like try to be creative. And so I, I was on the site all the time. And I noticed that the main writer of the site or like one of the sort of big stars of the site was a guy named Matthew Puglio. And at the bottom of Matthew Puglio's columns that he wrote personally was his email address. It was, you know, Matthew Puglio at Hotmail or something back then, right? And so I emailed him personally and I said, hey man, you don't know me from Adam. I know you, you put this email uh, address up for people to ask you fantasy baseball advice, but I'm looking for another type of advice. I sent like three emails to this jobs at rotoworld.com email, got no response. Can you, can you forward my email on to somebody there that knows what they're, you know, that whoever's hiring that, you know, job or whatever, can you tell me how to get noticed by your bosses? And he writes me back the next day and he says, I'm the guy, I'm actually the boss. He goes, that email box, inbox got so overfilled with people trying out that I just haven't had time to sift through it yet. It just got, you know, it, we, we had so many, in, you know, entries and it, he's like, I'm sort of a one man band here. He goes, but I looked you up on IMDb. Married with children is my favorite show of all time you're hired. So because I wrote on Married with Children, <laughs> and that Matthew Coolio liked it. He gave me a chance to write a free column for Roto World. Gave you a Again, chance to write a free column. That was free uh, column. Yeah. I took, no, it was just like, he's like, you know, you'll write for free and we'll see if people like you, you know, they'll come back. And if they don't, that'll be that. I'm like, all right. But it, I'm like, I was excited. I was still making a living as a screenwriter. Okay. I think I'm a pretty good writer. And by the way, this is another piece of advice. I understand that not everyone is in the financial position to do this. Everyone has different demands on their life. Everyone comes from different economic backgrounds. Um, so it, it is a luxury that I was able to have. The luxury was that at the time I was married, uh, but with no kids. Um, I had a career in screenwriting where there weren't, it's not really nine to five hours. It's, it's very loose. And I was making enough money as a TV and, and movie writer that I could that I could afford to do this on the side for free. So I was lucky in that respect. And I appreciate that not everyone is that lucky. But if there is a way for you to work for free, I highly recommend it because all you have to do is just get in the door and prove your worth. And once you prove your worth, I assure you, they will either pay you or somebody else will, but you just want a chance to prove you can do what you can do. You know, and if, if, if you are, a, anyway, I know there's a lot of controversy and debate about that. I am of the belief that if, if it is economically feasible, whatever you can to get your foot in the door, you do. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so at any rate, I'm a pretty good writer. I think I'm a pretty good writer. After four and a half years, I was the most popular columnist on Roto World. I think I finally got up to the, the, uh, the grand scum of, sum of $50 a column. That's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I was making like, so I was doing cut two columns a week. I was making a hundred bucks a week. And uh, so you bought a new house, oh, bought a sure. new car. Yeah. But people were starting to make money on the internet at that point. So this is 2004. And I thought to myself, Hey, you know, I think there's a uh, opportunity here uh, to maybe, you know, maybe I can start my own website and uh, start my own website and make some money on the side. So I left Roto World. Uh, and I started my own web website. I, this is before the days of like Wix.com where you could just grab a pre-made sure. website. So I, I, you know, I hired a programmer to build me a website with a content management system, you know, scraped together like 10,000 bucks of my own money that I had saved. And um, 
you know, hired some friends that were writers, found some people that were on message boards that I thought were smart. And I said, hey, I think your answers are really smart and thoughtful. And I'm starting this website. You want to come, you know, write for me. I had a couple of professional writer friends that I knew were good fantasy players. I'm like, you want to come do this? I can't pay you, but, you know, like, and you want to do this because you think it'd be fun. And they all said yes. And so I realized I didn't have any money to buy advertising. So what I realized is that the best way to advertise the website was me. Yeah. And so I went to every TV station, website, and radio station I could find. And I said, I will come on your air for free. I will write for you for free. Just link back to my website. Just mention my website. Again, just free. And this is at a time when people, you know, when. What year would this have been? What year was this? 2004. Okay. And um, I had a friend. This is another part of the story that I don't often tell, but I will I'll tell it here because I think this is an, an, an instructive. I had a friend that was on the, that was one of the founders of stamps.com. He was, okay. he was actually, he was actually married to a friend that, of my wife, uh, of my wife, my wife at the time, now my ex-wife, but my, uh, her friend was married to this guy, Jim, who was like one of the founders of stamps.com. And so, uh, you know, so I sort of tangentially knew him and I called him up and I said, Hey, can I meet, you know, can we meet? And so we, we had a lunch and I, I knew nothing about SEO or, you know, keywords or anything. Like, I'm like, how do I get traffic on the internet? How do I get people to my site? Sure. And we had a really, a hugely important conversation in the, in the structure of my life, which is he said, he said, well, you know, why don't you, why don't you hire an athlete to promote it? I'm like, I don't have enough money to hire an athlete. And even if we do at that point, athletes sort of thought fantasy was really nerdy and they held it at arm's length. And then he says, well, then why don't you hire the guy? And I go, what do you mean the guy? He goes, I don't know. Like, he's a guy, I know nothing about fantasy sports. He's like, but if you're telling me it's as popular as you say it is, and you think it's going to be even more popular, there's, somebody's the guy. Every industry has, you know, at least one person that when you think of that person, you know, when you think of that industry, you think of that person. He's just like, I don't know. Like, who's the, who's the Martha Stewart of fantasy sports? And I thought to myself, no one, honestly, you know, there's a couple of people yeah. that have been doing it for a while, but honestly, there's, there's no one. And he says, well, there's going to be, there's going to be someone who's going to be that person that when you think of, you know, fantasy sports, you think of fantasy sure. football, you think of that person, he goes, you know, and he, and he goes, you know, how long have you been playing? I'm like, you know, uh, I don't know, at this point, something like, you know, 15 years, 12 years, something like that, since I was 14 years old. He goes, how long have you been doing it professionally? I said, well, I've been since 1909. So I've been getting paid to write about it for six years at this point. This is like 2004, 2005, five and a half, six years. And it's just like, why don't you become the guy? That's and great. Like, that is I great. Go, How fortunate to have that conversation. Totally. And he, uh, he goes, he goes, I am telling you, someone will be that person. He goes, and if I were you, and I had the passion for this that you do and the background that you do, like someone's going to be that person you should do everything in your power to try to make it you. And that was a really kind of light bulb moment for me. And so I very specifically went after that goal. And I, Talented Miss Rota, which was the site that I'd started, became an even bigger advertiser for me, became all about me. And I started writing a daily blog all about me and you know, the love-hate columns. I started turning the stories, which would be about other people. I made, them, I made a lot more of them about me. And, um, uh, and I, again... Same thing. Just tried everywhere to put me on your air. I will, I will come on your air for free. I will write for free, et cetera, et cetera. One of the, you know, and again, sort of as trying to find a way, like I'm a big fake it till you make it kind of believer. And so there was a guy named Steve Mason of Mason in Ireland at the ESPN radio in LA. And he was a fan of my column and he put me on the radio for like one segment. Right. And uh, this is, I think this is an important lesson too. Uh, the, the station in LA, I was living in LA at the time. And they're like, oh yeah, so just call in at this time. I'm like, well, why don't I come down to the station? And they're like, it's, it's all the way downtown. Like, you want to drive all this way for a five minute hit? I'm like, yeah, it'll sound better if I'm in studio than as opposed to being on the phone, right? Sure. And they're like, yeah, but normally I'm like, but well, I don't mind. I want the station to be as great as possible. And I'm like, yeah, sure. Kid, knock yourself out. You can, here's the address. So, you know. And it's not that I cared about the segment. I obviously wanted it to be as good as possible, but I didn't care sure. about that. But in this world, and it's even more so now than it was back in 2004, but 
um, in this world of email and text and social media, never underestimate the importance of a relationship because when I went there to the studio, now I go and I got there a little early. Hi, I'm Matthew. Nice to meet you. I meet the producer. I meet the board op. I meet Steve in person. I shake their hand. I look them in the eye. Thanks so much. I'm so excited about this. Great. Do the segment. Okay. Hey, thanks so much. Oh, that was great. Really appreciate it. You know, uh, thanks so much. Uh, are you free next week? You bet. Now I'm like, I'm a living, breathing person in their face and they can yeah. see me. And they were, they were, as opposed to, I'm just a voice on the end of the phone. Okay. Thanks, Matthew. Boom. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that connection. And so one segment led to two. And then they were like the second week, they're like, well, you came all this way. Why don't you stick around for another segment? <laughs> and then it, like, so one segment turned into two segments, turned into an hour, turned into me doing guest hosting spots, turned into me getting a job at ESPN radio in LA, um, doing some part-time fill-in stuff, some sports radio, but also fantasy stuff for them. And then from there, I was able, like I met, a, I ended up meeting a producer of Cold Pizza, which is what First Take used to be called. Sure. And I was like, hey, what about a, what about a fantasy segment, a weekly fantasy segment? You know, I, I do stuff for ESPN Radio in LA. I'm kind of in the family. I'll, I'll come on your air for free. Okay, we'll give it a try. And that segment went well. And then I met a producer from ESPN News, same thing. I'm like, you know, I'm doing Cold Pizza and I'm, I'm doing ESPN Radio in LA. I'm already sort of in the family. You know, why don't we do a fantasy segment on ESPN News? Okay, we'll give you a shot. And that went well. And then I met an editor from ESPN, the magazine. You know, doing stuff for news and cold pizza. I got to, you know, I do this weekly thing for ESPN Radio in LA. I'm in the family already. Why don't you let me write a column for you for free at ESPN? And for ESPN, the magazine. And they're like, okay. And all that stuff was free. I didn't take one dime from ESPN for like those two years or whatever it was. Wow. But I kept working my way up. I was like, just mention my website. Just mention my website. Just link back to my website. And then eventually in 2007, fantasy football at that point had become popular. So to bring it back to your other question, all along this way, it's getting more and more popular. There's a, the New York Times publishes a study that shows the average football fan watches about three hours of football a week. The average fantasy player watches over six. And when the NFL saw that, they were like, oh, wait a minute. The more people get fantasy means the more football they'll watch. Yeah. And suddenly they embraced it in a big way, as did ESPN, because the more you play fantasy, the more you're invested in sports. The more you're invested in sports, the better it is for ESPN and the NFL sure. and NBA and MLB and, you know, any sports media company. So ESPN comes to me and they said, you know, we've been talking internally that fantasy football is big enough now that we need somebody. We need a guy. We, we've been talking like we need to find a Mel Kuyper. Can we find a Mel Kuyper of fantasy football? Um, and we like all the work we've done, you've uh, done for us. And at that point, the website was profitable. Like no one's buying any islands, but we were, we were in the black and we had a lot, you know, I, after three years of sort of, you know, you know, humping my butt to every microphone, every microphone and website I could find, like we had good presence and they were like, you know, listen, we want to, we want to buy your website move you to Connecticut and make you the guy. That's great. That was 2007. And at the end of my current contract with ESPN, I've been in the company 17 years. That is crazy. That is a great story. And I think there's so many, I wanted to interrupt you and ask other, we've got a lot of questions that people want to ask, but as you were going, there were great, you, you did a great job of stopping and pointing out, here's a learning moment that I had. And maybe you didn't know it at the time. It was such a learning moment, but looking back on it, you're like, this was really good that I did this particular thing. But uh, a lot of effort on your part and a lot of putting yourself out there and not being afraid to ask. Correct. And by the way, I mean, the truth is, so that's the story I normally tell, which is a little bit tighter, but I'll tell you guys this. And if you read the book, you'll, you'll see this as well. Like, ESP, when, when ESPN came to me and said, like, we want to Mel Kuyper of fantasy football, we want to buy your website, make you the guy. I had made that pitch to them already two different times and been turned <laughs> down. I had made the pitch to CBS twice and been turned down. I made it to Yahoo three times and been turned down. I made it to Fox twice, Fox Sports and twice and been turned down. Like, you know, the, the, the success is always easy. Sometimes when I do speeches, I do, you know, what I have is I have the person introducing me. Like I would have had Michael read an intro about me that's really over the top. You know, he's won an Emmy. He's, he's you know, this columnist. He's won these awards. He's, you know, this many reads and downloads and followers and blah, blah, blah. And it's really just, oh, my God, you know, amazing, 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 amazing. And then what I do is I then come up and I say, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much the man, right? How, how amazing is all that stuff? 
I said, <laughs> here's an intro. Here's an intro that Michael also could have read about me. That's 100% true. So, you know, and it's like uh, our next our next presenter, Matthew Berry, was fired from his college TV station for being too uncomfortable on air. Um, you know, he was fired from, uh, you know, two fantasy jobs before he got a job at Roto World. He was actually fired from Roto World, which is true. And then they hired me back because um, uh, they didn't like my style. Uh, you know, he's been uh, he's been kicked off the air. He's never done um you know, like a, a list of all the ESPN shows I've never done. You know, the fact that it's still to this day on ESPN, like I'm on our our main ESPN channel, ESPN One. I'm on ESPN One less than two minutes a week. People don't realize that. Literally doesn't. Anyway, and I just go through all my failures, which of which there are many, and how many times I've been turned down, where I've been fired, and you try to get a job here and didn't get it, try to get a job here and didn't get it. And I'm like, so the first intro is the fun one. You know, that's yeah. the one I tell the, you know, people at parties, but the first one doesn't happen without the second one. Yeah. Right. ESPN said yes on the third time and they thought it was their idea, but I'd pitched it to them two different times already. Yeah. I was getting ready to say, it's great that they finally came up with that Mel Kuyper concept. Yeah, exactly. Right. And, you know, and, and it's so funny because I've now met, you know, people that, um, uh, you know, pe people that were at, at other places the Fox and the Yahoo's and the CBS's that turned me down back then. And they're like, we were stupid. We should have done it. You know, like, and that's got to feel I, good. That's, that's got to feel good. Been a fantasy. What I said, that's got to feel good. It does. Honestly, yeah. it does. I would love that's, to, I'd love to say I'm above it, but I'm not. No, I, that's, I'm petty. We all have a little petty. When and it comes down to it, that's why we do this. Yeah, we just want to make feel bad that they didn't get to us first. Thousand percent. But <laughs> the point is, is that, Listen, I mean, I can't tell you how many times, you know, like that where I have tried something and failed. I yeah. mean, like the fantasy show, which is it's great, right? It's fantasy show with Matthew Barry. My name's in the title and everything like that. And it's on ESPN Plus. But like I pitched, I went to ESPN and said, we need to have a daily fantasy TV show every single year for like seven years before they ever gave me one. Guys, what about a fantasy show? Ah, Guys, fantasy football now does so well. Look at look at the numbers my column does. Look at the numbers the podcast does. Give me a TV show. Nah, we're good. We think fantasy's <laughs> better sprinkled in here. We don't think it'll work, you know. And, and and you know, and so regardless of whether that was right or wrong, the point is is that like I didn't get my own show. I didn't get a fantasy show, uh, you know, a, a during the week fantasy TV show until try number seven. Yeah. That's great. That is great. Well, I know that we are, even though you are willing to stay longer than you, than you normally would. Uh, and fortunately we have this budding up to lunch so people can uh, nosh on a hot dog while they, while they hear us wrap this up. But there are a couple of questions that I did want to get to um, that I want you to have a chance to answer. Uh, and, and you touched a little bit on these, you mentioned some different things, but I know that you lit up when we talked before about one piece that you've created that you would say is your personal favorite. That was something that sort of, struck you, uh -oh. you yeah i mean listen i like i said I, I personally love the fantasy show but i would say the book you know my, my book fantasy life and and the, and i'll again sort of here i'll try to make it a lesson as opposed to just talk, bragging about the book i went to when I, I decided i wanted to do a book and i went to the uh the first place i went to was hyperion which is owned by disney so try to keep it within the family they said no and we we pitched to a bunch of different places and they and and the feedback we got from a lot of places were was, yeah, we we think uh, like, but look at how many people read my column and they'd be like, yeah, but your column is free. And they read your column just because they want your advice on who to play, who to start and sit on Sunday in fantasy. You know, we don't think anyone's going to pay twenty five bucks for a hardcover book that has no fantasy advice in it. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I think I'm a pretty good writer and I think it'll be fun. And the other, and they're like, well, and, and they're like women, you know, your audience is men and, and women are the ones who buy books, which is true. Like the primary audience of book, more women buy books than men just in general. Um, uh, and so we just don't think men are going to buy this book. And I said, I'm going to do a book that I can pitch. I'm going to do a book that I can pitch on the view. Cause I'd be like, listen, I got a story about a league in, in the Bronx, New York, where the loser league has to dress up as a lion and the rest of the league hunts them down with, uh, with paintball guns. 
<laughs> right. That's funny. Like, I'm like, you don't need to under, you don't need to play fantasy or understand fantasy to realize that's funny to get that visual in your mind of 11 guys chasing another dude dressed as a lion and a paintball gun. Cause he finished yeah. last in his league. Like, that's funny. And I've, I've got a lot of stories like that. Um, anyway, the point is, is like, I got, no, 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 we don't believe in you. We don't think this is going to happen. I got turned down left and right. And, um, uh, but my, I had a great agent. He believed in me. We kept pitching and we eventually went to Riverhead, uh, which was a division of Penguin Books. And the guy there was a big fan of mine. And uh, he went in and he liked it. And he loved the pitch. And he loved my writing. Matthew Boyd is his name. And uh, Matthew Boyd went to the president of, of Penguin and they were having this little debate. And literally at some point, some woman that works at the company walked by. I don't know who this woman is, but there, she walks by and the president says, Sarah, come in here for a second. Sarah, do you know who Matthew Berry is? And Sarah goes, yeah, I saw him on the league. He's the fantasy football guy, right? Perfect. And, 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 and she goes, yeah, thanks. So he's like, okay. And they signed, they agreed to the book deal. Thanks to wherever <laughs> Sarah is. I don't, we I need to, f- we need to find Sarah. Honestly, we really need to find Sarah at some point. God bless her. But I, so I, I think it's the best thing I've written, but more importantly, because so many people, and it's, it's me, right? It was just me in front of my computer screen for like two and a half years. Yeah. Um, but because so many people told me, oh, that no one's going to buy your writing because you're, because no one's going to, no one wants to pay for your writing. And no one wants to read you if you're not telling them who to start and sit. And the fact that people plunk down $25 for a hardcover book of, uh, about fantasy football that, in, that contained not one shred of advice, and they did it often enough that it debuted at number five on the New York Times bestseller list, and it spent multiple months on the, on the list, I'm incredibly proud of. I'm incredibly proud of. So that is, that's the, the thing that resonates the, when you ask, like, what's my favorite? That. And it's because of, it is because of that, because I got so many people, because I felt like that was one that I did. That's not, you know, people like, oh, you're popular because you're on ESPN, you know, and make no mistake. Sure. ESPN is the largest sports media company in the world. It obviously helps in a significant way, but like ESPN didn't promote this book at all. Yeah. You know, this was, this was, this was me. And so I was just, anyway, that's, well, it means a lot to me. That's great. That is terrific. And I, I enjoy that. we do need to find Sarah at some point. So we have yeah, two. Exactly. But the, two- the lesson there is believe in yourself. Don't take no for an answer and believe in yourself. That is the yeah. lesson to the people watching here. That is awesome. All right. So we have two questions that are very similar and they're a little bit transactional. So we'll make a quick one here, we'll turn these into one question. Then we'll ask two questions and let, and let everybody go to lunch. So these were questions. There's two questions that came in about legalized sports gambling. Uh, one is how do you see it changing the industry, which is a much larger question. And I don't know if we want to get too far into how it's changing the entire industry. That sounds so like could, a panel. That's not a yeah. question. That's a panel. Yes, that's a panel. Uh, but there was a question in here that says, you know, have you ever considered adding picks to your segments and incorporating the gambling portion into the fantasy sports? Because I'm certain, and I'm certain you'll agree with this, that the audience for one is the audience for the other. And there's a lot of crossover between the two. I agree. The answer, have I considered it? Yes. Will I in the future? Yes. I'm trying to figure out, I'm working with my bosses right now to figure out how, yep. um, but especially the stuff like, uh, I don't know if I'm ever going to do game picks. Maybe at some point I will, but the truth is, is that the player prop stuff is right in my wheelhouse, you know, whatever I love. And honestly, it makes it easier for me because one of the struggles I have when I write love hate is like, you know, you want to say, well, I love Patrick Mahomes. No kidding, Barry. Like everyone loves Patrick <laughs> Mahomes. Like is there anyone in the universe that has Patrick Mahomes on the fantasy team that's not going to start Patrick Mahomes? So there's like, you know, and the same with like Aaron Rodgers or Russell Wilson or Josh Allen or Kyler Murray or whatever. Like there's a, this group of guys that you can't write about because it, it's just too obvious. And the yeah. few times I do, it's when they have a bad matchup. And I literally say, I get that it's obvious, but here's why I'm writing about it. I think he's worth the money in DFS or whatever it's worth paying up for. But with player props, it allows me to go, you know, now I can, it's not saying I love Patrick Mahomes. It's saying Patrick Mahomes is player prop is 275 passing yards. And I love the over here. And here's why. And now I can talk about, and that's helpful for sports gamblers and for fantasy players. You're still starting Patrick Mahomes, but, but yes, long story short. Yes. I think you will see me do a lot more player prop stuff, which is, you know, very easily, which has relevance to both fantasy players. If I say I like, you know, 
Jonathan Taylor playing the, you know, Jonathan Taylor's playing the Ravens who have a really good run defense, but I like the over on 67 rushing yards for Jonathan Taylor. That's helpful to people who have been on his roster and for sports gamblers. Yeah, I, I do think it's going to be interesting just as a, as a fan of both. I, I think it's going to be interesting how those two marry over the next five to 10 years and the legality of everything will have impact on that, I'm sure, as well. For sure. Um, all right, we're going to ask you a tougher question and then we'll give you an easy exit question. Um, the tougher question, uh, and I don't know if I'd say it's a tough question. It probably isn't that tough for you because you've worked with a lot of people, but a colleague that you have learned a lot from, anybody that comes to mind, um, boy, there's a lot of, uh, there's a Stephen lot of a people. Smith, Stephen a Smith and skip Bayless. Uh, I haven't, I mean, listen, I will tell you in terms of Stephen a, uh, you know, I, I mean, I know him, but I'm not particularly close with him. But one thing you learn from Stephen a is just energy, right? You want to be energetic on television yeah. and, um, and the importance of having conviction, you know, especially when you're in the, when you're in the take business and I am on some level, start this guy, sit that guy, draft this person you know, avoid this player, you know, so on some level I am. And so, you know, when you're watching me on TV, you want me to be like, eh, I don't think you want me to be like, eh, he could be good. Of course he could also not be great. Like you want me to, you want me to sell him, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. Yes. This is the quarterback you must start today. And here's why. And as long as I have a, a, you know, good reasoning that you guys, you agree with, then that's helpful. Um, you know, Bill Simmons is somebody, you know, he's not a colleague of mine anymore. He was for a long time, um, uh, you know, and I consider him a friend. He's been uh, he's been helpful. And I've certainly learned, um, uh, you know, from him about uh, uh, honestly social media and, and some business stuff. Um, Chris Berman is somebody Chris Berman. And this is going to sound random, but Chris Berman and Michelle Beadle are two people that in terms of broadcasting, I think Michelle Beadle is one of the, one of the all time great broadcasters of all time. And, you know, Boomer of course is a legend and both people in their own way, sort of talk, I talked to them about broadcasting and they were like, just be yourself. You know, a Boomer was always just like, I'm just, you know, Boomer's like, he talks with his hands. Oh, uh, you know, and just like Boomer, like about, you know, just sort of letting your personality shine through. And Michelle Beadle is the most natural um, broadcaster I've ever seen in my life in terms of like when you meet Michelle, some people you meet them in real life and they're one way and then you, they turn on the air and they're like, you know, they're Johnny sportscaster, right? You know, and hello and welcome to, you know, whatever. Michelle Beadle is literally like, that's her. Like it is literally the exact same when, when a camera's on her or off her. And so um, just trying to be uh, authentic, you know, and um, try to be, uh, try to be yourself. So uh, those are the, those are some of the ones that, uh, that come to mind in terms that's of, that's great. Uh, yeah, that's great. Well, um, the last one we'll ask you, and this really just relates back to the, to the students and you've done a terrific job throughout this of sort of stopping and pointing at a few things that uh, nuggets for them to learn and lessons to come from it. But if there was one piece of advice and I, if you've got a couple more to say, I, I interrupted you there. Um, if you do have one piece of advice for some young professionals looking to, to move into this sports entertainment business, what, what, what comes to mind? So I was just going to say the one piece of advice is just, and this can transfer to this is like, be yourself. Be authentic. Like, I believe audiences will forgive almost anything as long as you're honest with them. You know what I mean? Like, if you're just like, yeah, I screwed that up or what, you know, as long as you're honest with an audience, like, I think, I think people get in trouble when they try to fake their way through someone or they try to be someone sure. that they're not. Right. Um, so that's, and that's just one of the things is like, I think that um, even if you hate me, you sort of know who I am right? You know, through the columns and the podcasts and everything, like you get a real sense of the kind of person I am. Um, and so just being a, as authentic as possible. But the big piece of advice that I would give to anyone watching this, trying to get into it, is just to get good. And what that seems like, um, I know that sounds insane, but I can't tell you how many questions, Michael, I get about, well, how do I get an agent? You know, how do I get to ESPN? How do I get here? How do I get there? And there's a just get good. Whatever it is you want to do, just get good at it. I, because I promise you, most people in this industry, remember what it was like to start out. Most people are willing to help others. Most people want, but you're going to get one shot. 
I mean, I have an inbox filled with people wanting me to read their, watch their reels and read their stuff and whatever. And it's way too many, you know, for me to, to, for me to sift through. But when I do find time to do that, like if I read that piece of paper, I watch that reel and they aren't any good. I'm just like, I'm not ready. Now, now they're off to the side, right? Because I've got this huge stack. And that's, that's the case with anyone in sports media. And so when you get that shot, and I promise you, you will get that shot. You want to be as good as possible. So I would focus just on your craft. Do it and do it in any way possible so that when you get your shot, you will be ready. Like, I promise you, we are not, at ESPN, we are constantly looking for people to make us better. And I'm sure that's the same at, at Fox and Bleach Report and, and Barstool and, you know, pick a media company, pick any place that wants to do, you know, sports content, whatever. Like, we're all looking for people that will make us better. So if you get good, we will find you. Someone will find you. And it's easier than ever to get your audience, you know, um, it's harder than ever to break through because there's so many voices now. But the barrier to entry is, you know, like if do whatever you can that's close. Like you want to be a writer, write for a blog. Don't worry if anyone's reading this blog. Just get good at it. Just keep writing. You want to be a sportscaster? Like do it, do a, do a minute, you know, sports vlog every day on YouTube or TikTok or Instagram, whatever. Pick a medium. Like just get comfortable talking to a camera for a minute straight because that's a weird thing to do. It's hard to do. Just get good at it. Get smooth at it. Be interesting. Be comfortable with what you look like on camera. Like, just get good however you can to do what it is you want to do. Just do it. Find a way to do it. Keep doing it. Don't take no for an answer. You know, keep pushing through as I've sort of shown in some of the examples I have. Um, but you want, when you get that shot, and I promise you, you will get that shot. You want to be good and you want to be ready. You don't want to blow that shot. So, that's my big piece of advice is just get good. There is, uh, ev it is not a race. Everyone gets to where they're supposed to be in the time that they're supposed to be there. So if you're graduating, you say, I can't believe that guy got a job at, you know, the CBS affiliate. That guy sucks. Okay, whatever. But you know what I mean? It, like, it is what it is. Like, don't worry about that person's career. Yeah. Worry about you. Like, you'll get to where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. It's not a race. It is a, it is a journey. And, and that's, that is part of the journey. You will have ups and downs. And so I would just worry about, don't worry about anything else. Don't worry about your colleagues, anything, worry about getting good. Just get good at whatever it is you want to do. That's great and, advice. Yeah. Yeah. Great advice, Matthew. Uh, well, uh, I feel like I need to play the M the M and M song to play us out here. The only get one shot. And it's uh, though, right. I mean, Mike, yeah. I'm sure you get hit up for resumes all the time, right? In, in interviews and you meet somebody and if they're not ready, you just, they go to the back of the pile. You we, don't have we, time to give them a second chance, right? That's right. We, 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 uh, we're going to be doing a workshop later today. And that's one of the topics is you know, your first impression is that email that comes in. And if it's typos and, you know, you're expecting the person to set a meeting with you as opposed to you trying to set a meeting, there's a lot of things in there to be learned. So without a question, without question. Um, yeah. So thank you, make Matthew. To, to, to that point, just about the set, make it easy for someone to help you. That's yeah. a crucial thing as well. Make it eat. I can't tell you how many times somebody has said like, you know, like, oh yeah, send me a meeting. You know, it's, I don't need to chase you down, dude. Like you want advice from me. You need to chase me down. Like I, I have, I have other things to do. I got a job, you know, like, so somewhere, yeah, for people to help you. Somewhere my co-host Chris is cussing because that is his biggest thing. And I know I'm stealing his thunder by talking about it here. <laughs> I am. I'm so giddy right now, Michael. I can't even believe it. This is so good. We have the God voice coming in. All right, Matthew, thank you so, so much for joining us. This was very uh, enlightening and I'm sure inspirational in its own way for a lot of people. Uh, I, the greatest failure of all time, Matthew Barry. My exit will be the intro that I didn't give. Perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for joining us. And we'll talk to you again. Okay. My pleasure. Good luck to everyone. Thank you.